I mean, for you, it took three cycles. It took three touch points, your first one then your second one, 2017, and then the third one, the last one. Now you're entering your fourth one here. But, you know, for me, it took two. My second exposure took a long time. <laughs> um, but for me, I'm very fortunate at that. For me, it only took the two touch points. Um, it, like I said, the second one took a couple of years. Uh, you know, it sounds like with you, it was much shorter. But I think most people are going to endure that. I think most people, I think most people have already had their first one or maybe even two touch points. Mm -hmm. But I think people are about to have their third touch point, right? Like a lot of people, 2017 was their first touch point. 2021 was their second. I know this one's going to be the third one, right? For a lot of other people, uh, perhaps, you know, the more typical traditional finance crowd, maybe this last one was the first touch point. But I think for most people, it'll take two to four touch points for them to get it. So to me, that makes a lot of sense. And then what you're saying about, the why behind Bitcoin, I think super important. And, and I'd love to, you know, have you expand on that a bit more because I often give the metaphor of the locomotive versus the horse, right? You've heard me give that before. Everyone watching me has. But to me, that's like, it's such a good metaphor because it's the same thing. It's like, we could sit here and do all these podcasts about how the locomotive works. But if you're talking to someone that's a farmer or you're talking to someone that like, this isn't their thing, they don't care. Like they're not an engineer, like, you know, at, at that time, you know, engineering is not this common knowledge thing. Right. So like you're, you're basically trying to explain a very technical, hard to explain industry for people that have never had experience with that. But that's not what's going to help them understand why the iron horse is better than the horse. They're only going to understand it if you articulate, yes, all this technical stuff's important. You need to understand it to understand how the locomotive works. But the important thing to understand is that this is going to connect your cities this is going to change the professions you have. This is going to change warfare. This is going to change every social, cultural, militaristic, geopolitical, you know, whatever. This, it's going to change everything in in society, right? And once people understand that with the locomotive, then they put in the work to understand why the locomotive technically works, right? So I, I agree that the why first, the first principles, why this matters, why the locomotive matters, why Bitcoin matters. I think that's a really important point to hone in on. So for those watching, you know, we probably have three groups of people. Probably some people watching, number one, are Christians that don't understand Bitcoin, but want to. Number two are probably Bitcoin people that are, are not Christians or, 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 you know, don't want to, you know, don't have that framework. Um, but, you know, have some other moral framework that they're, you know, fitting Bitcoin into, right? That would probably argue, you know, a Christian framework is not essential for that. And then probably the third group of people are people that agree with us, right? Which, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but anyway, point is, in, in regards to all three of those categories of people potentially watching this discussion, Alan, why is this digital locomotive, why is Bitcoin fit into what you just described, a fitting into that Christian worldview? Why is Bitcoin, from a first principles, why first perspective, important? Well, well that is a loaded, very big question that, you know, I kind of envision it like this little ball that just blows up and keeps going and going and going and going. You can really, really take this thing in a hundred million infinite directions. Um, because at the end of the day, Bitcoin is, I mean, if you just simplify it, it's a computer program, but under the hood, it's more than that. It's, it's math, it's cryptography. It's all this, it's all this stuff. And so fr from a Christian worldview, well, it really is the found. OK, let me maybe break it down this way. This is how I've understood it in a sort of meta metaphysical sense. Um, you know, Genesis one, it talks about the creation, God making the heavens and the earth. And we all know about Genesis one, one in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then God and then later on, it says, God said, let there be light. And there was, and then the pattern throughout Genesis one is God speaking words and things happening, you know, birds and, and land creatures and all this stuff. God speaks and it is. And, uh, you know, you go to John one, one in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. John is obviously connecting Jesus with Genesis one and helping us to see that he's the creator and he's the word. He's the one who made all things. And so I thought about that and I, you know, it was always a sort of this thing like, okay, yeah, Jesus is God. Jesus is the word. Okay, let's move on. But what, what is creation really? What is creation made of? You know, the Bible says that he upholds it by the word of his power. What is that word? What is that language? Um, 
everything can be quantified in the material world. You, you look around you, really what you're looking at is uh, a language, a code, which is running. So the way I understand creation is that God encoded it. He coded this thing, and now he's running the software. And what you see is what you see. That's the software being run. And the language that God uses in his creation code is the language of math. So what Bitcoin has done is it's taken God's um, it's taken God's first principle um, code and built a layer two on top of it. We call it Bitcoin. This is why it's so fascinating to people. At first, I'm like, OK, Bitcoin, it's it's cool. It's a cool technology. But really, all you're doing is just sending like bits and bytes to people. Right. Like, it, is it really that profound? Well, when you think about what is really happening is Bitcoin has built on top of God's foundation of math, the, the, the language of creation. It's built a layer two money on it. And it's running, and that's why it works, because it's running on God's original language, his original code. So I know a lot of people might be listening going, man, you sound crazy. <laughs> you sound like you're taking this thing a little bit too far. Of course, I get that a lot. You're taking this thing too far, Alan, like just worship God. I don't understand how advocating for a sound, hard money, which will bless all of God's creation is somehow not focusing on God or something. It's it's really a, a quite quite the strange um thing to to say. Uh, but yeah, so that's how I see it. Bitcoin builds on God's layer one and um piggybacks on God's creation in in, in so far the best way as uh, for human beings to to transact with one another. I don't know if this is making sense to you or no, not. no, no, I, I think it does. I mean yeah, I think it does. I mean, basically, you have the layer that is math. You know, the Christian would argue that math is something God created, like God's the foundation. Math is, is the software, as you described, that God uses to have the laws of the universe run. Obviously, the atheist or, or the or the agnostic wouldn't have that. So they would say it's just the way the universe is that, you know, the software is there. But, you know, either way, you have God then you have math. And then all you're saying is that in the same way that, like I said before, the locomotive has to obey the laws of physics to work you're just saying the reason bitcoin's profound and works is because bitcoin is on top of that it follows the math right in the same way that you don't build a house that can defy the laws of physics you know bitcoin is like this computer software that follows the laws of math right if i'm understanding you correct yeah exactly That's so then exactly. so then alan the natural question is why how is bitcoin following that like all these other things, they also have to, you, you can't break the laws of fix. You can't break math. So what is right. it uniquely about Bitcoin that it's doing this thing of, you know, obeying God's software and everything you're describing? Why is Bitcoin unique in that sense? I want to thank you for being a supporter of mine and a viewer of my channel here and a follower of mine. It really means a lot to me that you would support me in my efforts to expand Bitcoin education to a wider and wider audience. And someone else that's doing the same here is my friend and fellow partner and supporter, Brian DeMint. Brian DeMint has done many efforts in Bitcoin here over the last few years, and this is one of them. This is his book. It's Bitcoin Evangelism. See, Brian was the former founder of a crypto project, and once he realized Bitcoin and why it's unique compared to other digital assets and other forms of tokens and money. Uh, he wrote this book. He wrote this book comparing why Bitcoin is unique in this sense. So no matter if you're new to Bitcoin, if you're trying to preach the message of Bitcoin, or you, or you know someone that is a little more advanced, you know, wherever your experience level, where you are, this is a book that's probably going to be very useful to you. The text is very readable. Lots of bolded quotes from many people throughout history about why Bitcoin's unique. Comparisons to former technology and why Bitcoin, is, in a similar way, people are irrationally scared of it in the beginning. And lots of great visuals explaining various aspects about Bitcoin, uh, the regular political currency and financial system, and why Bitcoin is most likely going to go up in purchasing power in the future. So again, whether you're new to Bitcoin, you're just trying to explain to someone why Bitcoin is unique compared to other uh, crypto tokens, crypto projects, and political currencies, uh, this could be a good visual aid for you to share to people with easy to readable text and great concepts in there as well. So if you want to continue to support me and you want to support someone else, Brian DeMint's book, Bitcoin Evangelism, I highly recommend you check it out. Thanks.
you say you can't break the laws of math, but but what fiat does is it does break. Maybe not the laws of math in the sense of that it you know in fiat two plus two equals five or something, right? Two dollars plus two dollars equals four dollars. See, fiat works. No, that's not that's not what what I'm suggesting. Um, what fiat does is it breaks the law of sowing and reaping in the universe, and this is why we have chaos among humanity under a fiat standard is because God's law says that he speaks and things are created. So we have the things that are created. We have the universe. We have everything we need. God has made it, and he made it on the merit of his own word. So he spoke and coded the the software of the universe and it works, and everything falls under his authority. So God has the ability to make real value by his word. By his fiat, he can create real value. This is necessary. This is a necessary precondition for anything, right? People ask, why is there anything? Um, Why does anything exist? The necessary precondition for existence, intelligent existence, is an intelligent mind that is outside of creation. So God is the necessary precondition for all things. He creates all things, and it's all good because by his merit, he does it. So here's the thing. He puts us here now, and he says, use what I made. All of this, I made it all. Use it, reformat it. Uh, uh, structure it in such a way as to expand, be fruitful, multiply, use what I made to create different layer two technologies in order to make life flourish. That's the point. That's what it means to be made in God's image. So what fiat money does, it turns that mandate on its head and it says, Humans have the ability to speak value into existence. That's what fiat money is. It's decreeing value on the merits of what? On the basis of what? Of the will of man, not the will of God. Money is supposed to be a free market technology that organically and naturally arises among people due to its um, favorable attributes for trade. That's not what fiat money is. Fiat money is a decree from men. This is money. This is value. On what basis? On the basis of our word. So it's 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 a it's a it's a carnal fiat, not a divine fiat. So that's why you see chaos in 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 disruption in the monetary network because it's breaking not the laws of math per se, but the but the laws of God in the universe. You must sow in order to reap. I'm not sure if that answered your question. No, but... no, I, I think it does very well. I, I mean, I would I would probably frame it differently. I would say the reason we have chaos is not fiat money. I would say the reason we have chaos is sin. Right. But I do think that. Well, I mean, really, if, if you think about you know what is sin, what is you know the sin of Adam and Eve, what is the sin of every human being, you, me, everyone watching this, like. What is our fundamental sin? Our fundamental sin is we want to go against the the order and rule that God has desired, right? The taking of the fruit is saying, I want to be God. I want to make my own rules, right? And so what you're saying, you know, I think is a bigger picture than just fiat money. I think chaos is sin issue. But then the fiat, like you're describing so well, is that saying, here's a set of numbers. And now I can distort those numbers to where I get an artificially larger amount of those numbers, right? You know, Alan is a hundred dollars. I have a hundred dollars in light of the recent emergency or whatever <laughs> people have voted to me the power that I can now create for myself another hundred dollars to where we've gone from 50, 50 to now I have two thirds and you have a third, right? Like I am basically this monetary guy that can just create energy up thin air because now via the force of a gun, I can confiscate your resources at those two numbers. Right. So yeah, so I I fully get what you're saying. I mean, I I probably expand that more to a larger sin issue, and then yeah. you know, if you really think about sin, sin mm-hmm. is ma- man um, decreeing their own um, right and wrong, right? Yeah. Sin is yeah, sin is fiat in the sense of it's it, so I like to I use these two categories: carnal fiat and divine fiat. So the carnal fiat is when man decrees anything. 
uh, outside of God's prescribed order. That's called carnal fiat. Uh, and sin, all sin falls into that category because all sin is uh, men decreeing against God's decree, uh, supposing we're smarter than God. You know, this is what happened in the garden with Eve. She was deceived. Uh, well, yeah, you know what? Maybe God, maybe God didn't really mean what he said. Maybe this serpent has a, has a, has a, you know, a good point here. And, and she went against what he said. So um, divine fiat is what God's decreed. So like I use this analogy a lot because it it works and it makes sense in our current climate, in our culture. Divine fiat is this. God has decreed Luke is a man. Okay. This is a, you were born a, a male. Right. We're all in agreement. <laughs> um, I agree. Carnal, <laughs> carnal fiat would be Luke saying, no, I disagree, God. You must now. Uh, identify me as a woman. You must call call me she and her. You must call me uh, whatever the feminine of Luke is. I, I don't know. Um, or Cindy or something. So that's carnal fiat. That's saying, no, God, you are wrong. Your decree was wrong. My decree is authoritative and everyone has to agree with it. This, um, this is carnal fiat. And it's just in one area. Sin in all areas acts in the same way. No God, you're wrong. I'm right. Period. Mm -hmm. And and in in the in the monetary system, that's what fiat money fundamentally is. Saying no God, sorry, I know you said sow and reap. We're just gonna reap and reap mm -hmm. and steal and pillage. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. And this, for me personally, you know, Alan, I'm sure you agree, but for me personally, this is why you know advancing Bitcoin for me personally is so important because. I believe if, you know, what is money? Money is the base layer level of communicating value across society, right? We spend money on things we value, right? Uh, you know, that could be a person, that could be a place, that could be a vacation, that could be a new car, that could be whatever. You know, like Jesus said, you know, you your your treasure is where your heart is, right? Or your heart is where your treasure is, right? I mean, and so my view is that, you know, some people view fiat money political currency as the root of all problems or the root is all evil but i think the root of all problems is sin you know a right. layer below but i do think that political currency fiat money this this false fiat money right that that you're describing is human-led fiat money um i think that brings an economic incentive to perpetuating and expanding sin right so obviously you just touched on a very controversial issue of, you know, male, female, you know, sexuality, all that. But I mean, and, and isn't that interesting that that's controversial? Why? That's my point. That's my point is that, you know, especially, you know, the older generations, you know, you know, the boomers, it's like so many of them that I talk to are like, I don't recognize is forget the country. Like I don't recognize the world. Like I don't recognize and, and you know, and it's, and it's sad. It's sad for them that they're seeing the world, in many ways deteriorate and it's sad for the younger people that they're being led astray in a wide variety of issues which we don't have to get into here but i think the the fundamental reason it's not that something new has changed like it's not like it's the president's fault it's not like that some magical thing just shifted like the world's always been broken but right. and i think we see this in history when there is a when the culture the the monetary network of the culture is incentivized to perpetuate the lies and the distortions of the false decree of human beings that you know sowing and reaping is no longer reality like i think that incentivizes everything else right i mean we saw this in germany with their hyperinflation you know we've seen sexual deviancy uh we've seen you know infanticide we've seen genocide we've seen all sort of moral tragedies and travesties happen in tandem with the direction of the nation's currency right and, and the problem is not political currency the problem is sin and in my right. view political currency is just a technological exploit for perpetuating and accelerating the rate exactly. of sin at every level, level of society so. so what when christians will ask me or or, or comment saying hey man you know like be careful because you don't want to fall into the love of money. You know, you talk about money a lot. Don't fall into the love of money. And and it, and I'm sure it comes from a sincere place of, of love and care. Of course, you don't want to fall into the love of money. Uh, I'm not suggesting that that's a good thing. However, what I'd like to respond to them with is this. Look, if you 
or rather, let me say it this way. If a society um, corporately deviates from God's law, do you think it's going to be a good outcome or a bad outcome? Well, if you're a Christian, you're going to say, well, if a, if a society deviates from God's law, that's going to be bad for them. Exactly. That's the point. We have corporately as a society, and you really could say as the world, since the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency, have deviated from God's command in the uh, area of money. You know, God tells us in Deuteronomy 25 that we should have a just and fair weight, that our money should be such that the policies are just and honest and fair and not um, manipulated in any degree. It should be open and fair for everyone. That's the poli That's God's monetary policy. So if, if, if you take the whole world and you twist God's law in this area and you make it the opposite, what do you think is going to happen? That's a sin. And now you're proliferating sin to every human being using this monetary network. Now, I'm not saying if you hold dollars, that's a sin for you. No, he who... Uh, oversees the system has the greater sin in this situation. We are simply the oppressed because like you said earlier, they're holding a gun to us and saying, use this money. And if you don't, it's going to go bad for you. Um, so the, the sin is not in the oppressed. The sin is on the oppressor. That might seem extreme for some people, but that's the reality that that we live under. Well, so, well, well that's I mean, for, for a side note, if, if I may interrupt, you know, that, that's how all sin is, right? It's like, People, you know, again, in our own world decrees, we want to pretend like there's good people and bad people, right? And we'll split people based on race, uh, on class, on age, on, you know, gender, on, you know, you know, all of us want to think there's good people and bad people. But the reality of sin, and, and I, as you well described with fiat, but then expanding it even further, all sin, mm -hmm. is that we're all victims and perpetrators, right? I'm a victim of sin all day, every day, and I'm a perpetrator of sin all day, every day, as are you, as in everyone else. So just to make that point, but, you know, that that's, that's the problem with fiat is that everyone's to blame because we right. all go along with it and no one's to blame right mm -hmm. but some are more to blame than others that's for sure 